I'm Valerie Steves. I'm a professor in the Department of Criminology here at the University of Ottawa, and this is my colleague and dear friend, Val Michelson, uh, from uh, Queen's University. And what we wanted to do is take, take some time to talk to you about a project that we worked on together over the past year that I think has some really interesting lessons for policy making. So it comes out as a collaboration between two projects, the Equality Project, which is here at U of O and is co-led by me and Jane Bailey. Um, and some of you may know that the Equality Project is really focusing on kids' experiences of privacy and equality in network spaces. But it really comes out of our concern with two gaps. So the research we've done together over the last 15, 18 years now indicates that there's a, a significant gap between the way policymakers talk about privacy and the way kids experience and ask for privacy. So you'll be familiar with the data protection legislation that governs private sector collection of kids' information in Canada. And it's based on the assumption that if you want to keep something private, you won't disclose it. So consent works. You know, if, if you post it up on Instagram, well, you've consented, you've disclosed it, you no longer are interested in keeping it private. But when we talk to kids, it's very clear that just because something's on the internet doesn't mean that they'll be furious at their mother if she looks at it. Um, from, from kids' point of view, privacy, especially in network spaces, is all about audience control. It's about relationships that are built on trust and how this kind of invasion can violate those relationships of trust. It has a lot to do with their online reputation as the Privacy Commissioner has been exploring um, in the latest round of consultations. So that's the first gap. The second gap is, is um, um, really comes between, uh, there's a gap between adults' concerns about being online and kids' concerns about being online. And porn is the best example. Um, you know, adults get concerned that kids are on the internet, they're on the internet earlier and earlier, they could see porn. And so what adults typically do is they turn to surveillance. We need to protect the private space of childhood. We will protect the children in that private space by basically invading their privacy and putting them under surveillance. We need their passwords. Uh, we need to watch them all the time. We need to mirror their phone with our phone so we can see what they're looking at. Whereas kids' point of view, this makes no sense of it all, at all. First of all, they have a very different relationship with porn. 13 and 14 year olds will sit there and say, what are you guys so worried about? Do you watch movies? Do you see ads? Do you see it everywhere? So this is just part of the world that we navigate. We have our own ways of navigating it. And ironically, our desire to put kids under surveillance to protect them actually interferes with the ways that they've come up with to deal with the types of concerns they have about online content and online interaction. So the Equality Project is really looking at new kinds of research, new research collaborations that are going to put us in a position to get a much better sense of what kids are experiencing in network spaces and the kinds of legislative and policy initiatives that will help them make the most of those experiences. So then I met Val. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Hi, hello everybody. I am Val, and it's so fun to work with another Val. We, um, I come from a, this interdisciplinary collaboration, bringing this over to the Department of Public Health Sciences. So I have no background in uh, media or in legal issues, but I spend most of my time thinking deeply about the well-being of children. So how do we set people, children up to thrive? What are the barriers to their flourishing? And I like to take an assets approach of how do we set things up? Like where are things going well? And let's try to foster those things. In my public health work, I also take a right based approach. And one of the things that's informed our program of research is Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which states that children have a right to a voice. They have a right to be heard, to be consulted in matters that concern them. And so as adult researchers, mainly of adolescent health, we recognize that we're saying some really important things about the lives of children that are going to impact their lives, and we need to involve them, and we need to consult them. It's more than about rights, though. so they have that right to be consulted. Because what we've learned is that children are the best people to reflect on their own lives. And as we've taken this rights-based approach to say to, to kids, what's it like to be a child in the world today? 
Our academic program has been given so much more depth and richness and substance, creativity than we actually could ever have anticipated. We were doing this initially because we thought it was a good thing to do. And it's opened up all kinds of interesting projects, including this one. We started our youth engagement program of research about four years ago. And we said to the young people that gathered, what is the most important health issue facing kids your age? I wonder if you, anybody has a guess what they said, because we wanted to explore what is really important to child health. Would anybody have a guess what they would have said? The most important public health issue facing 11 to 15 year old kids. Yeah? Uh, they want their, their freedom. Freedom, that's very, very close to what they said. Any other ideas of what they might have said? Yeah. Autonomy? Very close. They actually, we were wondering, you know, we always want to study risk behaviors and um, violence and um, nutrition, physical activity. They said overprotection. You are keeping us so safe we don't get to do anything. We, we're not even allowed to... to fail a test, we're not allowed to lose a soccer game, you're keeping us so safe. And so they wanted to study overprotection. And that started a really interesting participatory project with kids, looking at the benefits of safe risk in the lives of kids. So that's a different project, which I'd be glad to point you to. And when we finished that up, we said to them, okay, what else? What else is is um, facing kids your age that you want to explore? And we, we gave it back to them to say, what questions do we need to ask? And they said, well, we should take a look at social media. And at that point, I knew who to get involved, so I just got on the phone and, and said to Val, do you want to come to Kingston? And we're going to talk with these young people. Um, because we realized that without their insights in our research, our, our work is impoverished, our, our solutions are not durable. Our solutions might even be inappropriate for the populations that we're trying to help. And we know this a lot from public health work. When we don't understand the populations that we're trying to form health promotion or intervention initiatives for, we often miss the mark. And we've certainly um, done that around smoking and misunderstood social contexts around smoking and all kinds of other public health related issues. If we don't understand the groups that we're targeting and our interventions and our policies, we're likely going to miss the mark. So we need to get children's voices involved in this. Children have the need not just for to be consulted, but actually for meaningful participation. And so this ladder of participation is something I love to work with. UNICEF uses it a lot. The World Health Organization uses it. And it just shows that sometimes when we, we get kids involved, um, trying to get their participation, it's actually they serve more as a decoration. Um, they're put up in front for the photo. We say, do you, um, do you like this idea? And they say, yes. And then we sign off and we say, isn't this great? We consulted kids. But meaningful participation is much, much more than that. It's where the young people are involved and in even understanding, helping us to identify what questions do we need to ask? How can we work together so that we're not creating solutions for kids that we're imposing on them, but we're actually creating solutions for real problems that they've identified in their worlds with them. And so that leads us into my uh, increasingly favorite research method, participatory research. I'm gonna turn things back to Val. So um, you can tell that from the perspective of both of these projects, which have approached the issue really quite differently and certainly from different disciplinary lenses, that um, there's a natural fit with a research method that gets the researcher out of the way. So participatory action research is community-based research, <laughs> and it was designed to deal with the power dynamics and the relationship between researcher and research subject. So if we go in and we study kids as subjects, then we position ourselves as knowers, and and it, it, it limits the type of information that we can gain through those kinds of methodologies. So when we, when we sat down around a table and talked about what we wanted to do, they said, well, we really want to become researchers. We want to do this stuff. Um, it was a natural fit. Um, it's, it's a good corrective to the types of gaps that we've seen in the Equality Project and the types of concerns that you've raised in the Child Health 2.0 2, uh, 2 Project because it, it, it's the kids who define it. The kids define the research question. 
the kids um, help co-design the methodology. We are people who have expertise that they can ask questions of, but at the same time it's really co-produced with, with the subjects themselves or the participants themselves. And what's most interesting about it is that you also sit down with them afterwards and say, let's analyze this together. What do you see? What kind of themes matter to you? And how should we be interpreting these themes? So it's, it's a really interesting method that um, we've been using to great effect in the Equality Project. And, and this is one small example of, of, of a body of work that we hope that will lead into a youth summit in 2020. Jane usually corrects me because I usually get the date wrong. And it's like, <laughs> next Tuesday we're having a youth summit. And it's not. It's like 25, 27, sometime in the very far future. Um, but, but what we want to do is bring policymakers and kids together to have deliberative dialogues, which is a, a method that builds on this type of research, to, to connect these kinds of findings and perspectives with policy. Um, so so the, um, um, with this project, six of uh, the, the kids in Val's uh, group decided that they wanted to participate. They're between the ages of 12 and 15. And as we, as, we, as we talked about their concerns about media, it was really a fun day because you know, they went down they said, talk to us. What do you think about this stuff? What has your research shown you? So we talked a lot about the privacy research. And what they focused on really was this notion of connections. So they, 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 they echoed what I've heard for a number of years, both in quantitative and qualitative research with kids in Canada, that they're a bit worried about technology. It's fun. It's not like we want to get rid of it. But how does it affect our connection with ourselves? How does it connect, uh, connect our connection with others? And interestingly, how does, it connect, how does it affect our connections with nature? So if we think about that, um, they're really opera operationalizing privacy. So they're not talking about disclosure and non-disclosure. They're not even talking about performing in public and private spaces. They're not theorizing it that way. But they are talking about three things that resonate really strongly, particularly with Weston's broader definition of privacy. So if we look at connections with the self, that really falls within the function of privacy for self-evaluation. Weston's insight, drawn out of the sociological literature at the time, that to get privacy legislation right, we have to understand that one of the things it does is it creates spaces for us where we can withdraw and we can reflect and we can we can we can um, take our experiences and and figure out what they mean to us. So that self reflection is very very important from a privacy perspective. Um, the second one, our connections with other people, really is directly um, um, attached with that privacy state. Weston talks about intimacy that we need to create private socio technical spaces because they're essential to allowing us to develop relationships of trust and caring with the people who are closest to us. Um, and lastly, when they talk about nature, I think it really does talk about privacy as a form of withdrawal, resonating again with Weston's um, a state of solitude, that one of the things privacy does is it gets us away from everybody else, not just to withdraw from sociality, but to just be in a space where I can, I can, I, 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 it, it all turns off. I can turn down the volume, I can go for a walk in the woods and, and be, as opposed to be on or be interacting. So, um, and, and again, I think this is a really important point because we often find when we're trying to connect kids' experiences with privacy legislation, um, we have to be cognizant of the fact that when they talk about privacy or when we talk about privacy, it captures a number of different values and relationships that are important to them. So. We sat down and said, how are you going to do this? You want to know how, how technology affects you? And they said, yeah, it's too bad. We can't go back to the Stone Age like you guys where there was no technology. And, you know, you went and God drew the water from the well. And uh, yeah, you're right. You can't. You can't go back. But you could turn it off. And it was like, what? Like, you got to be kidding me. So we, we, we talked for quite a while, about an hour, about this notion of a media fast. Um, and, and it... it it, they, they, they sat down and they said, look, if we're going to take ourselves seriously, if we really do want to know how this impacts us, we do have to come up with a way of measuring that. So um, we, we devised this diary method where they, they kept a diary. First, we mapped out everything they do with technology and how they use it and where they are and all this type of thing. And, and they got a sense of, of what it looked like from that point of view. And then we created a diary and said, okay, if this is what you're doing and this is what you're using, here's a mechanism to let you reflect on that for a week. 
So take a week, use technology the way you normally use it, and at the end of the day, you know, write down how you felt. How did it affect your connections? What did you notice? What, what was the most important to you? What was kind of a waste of time? That type of thing. So they kept that diary for a week. Um, and then um, once that process was completed, they, they, they wanted to go cold turkey. They said, we are going to go on a media fast for seven days. We're turning it all off, and we're going to see what the world looks like. And then they said, oh, except I can't do that at school. Like, I can't. Like, I, I have to hand in assignments, and, you know, my teacher puts my homework up. And then they said, ah, my mother will kill me because when I'm at soccer or violin or, you know, dance, um, she's going to make sure, that she wants me to have my phone so I can text her when, I, when I'm done so she knows when to come and pick me up. So, my, so I can't do that. So I'm going to have to make sure that I can use technology. Oh, God, and then I've got an after-school job. My employer sends me my schedule by email. It's the only thing I use email for. And, and it was a really interesting moment because even when they were trying to design this fast, the first thing that kind of slapped them across the face is that we make them use it. That, you know, the, the, the myth out there is that kids are digital natives and they take to technology like otters to rivers. Uh, and yet, kids often tell us, you know, my mother made me get a Facebook account because she wants me to stalk my cousins. <laughs> I don't want a Facebook account! Now we have to deal with all the bullying at school. Like, it's ridiculous. So I, I think that was really, I, I think one of our most important, our first analytical finding was that we have to be much more reflective about our demands of kids and how we shape the environment and require them to participate in certain things. The other really interesting thing that came up that Val's going to follow up with in a minute um, when it came to just designing the fast was, was, was music, earbuds earbuds more than anything else. So, you know, they've got all their devices all over the place. They made a list of everything they do, and they, they work it all out. We figure out rules that they devised for going on this fast. And I said, okay, you've done everything. What about music? And they were like, what? Well, wait a minute. I can't possibly. No! I can't give up my earbuds. And um, my favorite, my, one of my favorite moments of this whole thing was, was I, I sort of said, well, you can if you want. And they said, but when I get on the bus, I have to have my earbuds on. What would I do? And then they looked at me and they said, what do you do on the bus? <laughs> the old people, you old people. And, and it was a really interesting negotiation because they used it to screen out so much. So since they were interested in connection and their ability to move between private and public spaces, um, the rules they came up were, with were, I can listen to music, but only if I listen with somebody else. <laughs> So I can turn it on in the kitchen, I can, but I can't turn it on in my bedroom and I can't use earbuds anywhere because that's just me. So, so um, um, uh, again, fascinating negotiation with technology and the role of technology in their life. Um, we followed up after there, and then they kept a diary for that week too. So we had some textual analysis, we had all of the, the data we collected while they were designing the system. We took it back to them and, uh, and, and, and before um, uh, we did the analysis, we followed up with individual interviews because we wanted a chance for them to be able to talk about their experiences with other friends in the room so they could be a bit more reflective and have a bit more space about what they wanted to say. And then we took all of that back to them and sat down with them and went through the analysis. So to, to, it's important to remember as we go through this that they designed the method. Because the first thing that really came out was that there was a real commonality in their thoughts before the fast. Disconnecting was going to be a very bad thing, a disaster. It would be really difficult. I'm really worried about it. It's going to annoy me. It's such a huge thing to do. And I'm going to be super bored. Because if I can't use my technology, well, I'm going to be cut off from all the things that keep me from being bored. You know, can I just interject? Sure. They were even, in the interviews, they talked about telling their friends they were going to do this. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the kids reported that his friend said, well, are they going to know if you, if you don't? Like, how are you going to do that? Are you going to die? Why don't you just use it anyway and they'll never know? Yeah, just and, but but the, the guy was so committed because these were their rules. Yeah. So he said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. But the friends were so suspicious about uh, well, what kind of, how are you going to get around this? Do you have to do it? Yeah. yeah. So, and again, they're negotiating with their friends, negotiating yeah. with their parents, negotiating with their teachers. So it was, and we talked to some of the parents too. And they the also, parents were quite anxious. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's also like, will I be able to get them? Yeah, <laughs> will, they, will I know where they are? Yeah, or even just the conversations that that generated around the dinner table when they were actually on the fast were really, yeah. really interesting as well. Um, boredom is a really important piece of this, though, because when we dug around, what are you concerned about by disconnecting? Boredom came up a lot. In fact, boredom comes up over and over again, but in different contexts. So in 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 this early um, context, uh, it it was I am always busy. I am required to be busy. Um, one of the, actually later on, one of the one of the participants told me that um, we talked about co like uh, co publishing, so co authoring a piece with them. And she said, "Well, that would be really good because my guidance counselor told me that if I don't get publications, I won't get into the university of my choice." She's fourteen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and really competent, and a smart kid who's going to have good grades. So they they're around boredom. It was kind of it was wrapped up in this notion of busyness. And this this imperative to always be social, to be busy, to and be building, a TV, doing something accomplishing productive. something, something productive. Yeah. So if I can't be accomplishing something, I can go on my computer or my, my phone, and I can accomplish something. I can go through Instagram. I can do something. So so it was uh, so boredom again. I'm, I'm just going to flag that because it's going to come up. It's, it's it's we're writing a whole paper just on boredom just because on boredom. it was such interesting findings. Um, then when they actually they do the fast. We looked at you know how they felt, and they said, "Yeah, we thought it was going to be annoying, but I actually got used to it." In fact, I didn't find it that bad. You know, it 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 it, it created an opportunity for me to do different things. I was surprised I could do it. I was proud of myself, but I found I was more open-minded, which is a really interesting comment. Um, I, I, when I thought about the things I was missing, I thought, you know, I, I'm gonna, I, I can talk to my friends at, at school and find out what's going on in Riverdale, um, and I can still be part of that conversation. But I don't necessarily need to be plugged into Netflix every second that that I possibly can be. And so they they found that that when they did unplug, they were surprised by the fact that they they cared less than they thought they would. That it, 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 it wasn't as bad, they didn't miss it that much, and it created spaces for other things. And this really, really resonates with research that we've um, um, got from the field since 2011 at least, where kids have said we're concerned that these technologies are interfering with our ability to do other things. They make us lazy, we can sit on the sofa, I can watch Netflix, text my friends and order a pizza without ever going outside. And, and maybe we need to pull back. So I think this underlines that kids are actually much more critical users mm -hmm. of technology than adults often give them credit for. Um, certainly, that space got filled up with different things. Um, a number of them said that they hung out with friends in person. That was great, unless their friends were on their phones, and then it was not so great, um, which you'll pick up in a bit. Um, they, they were all amazed, you know? Like, usually Sunday night, I'm doing all my homework. I hate homework. I hate school. But I got all my homework done by Tuesday. And then I didn't have to worry about it for the rest of the week, and nobody yelled at me about homework, which was really a nice, uh, a nice uh, moment. Um, they found listening to music with friends and family. Um, uh, they, because they did that, they discovered they had similar and different tastes with people. And they really enjoyed sharing music and learning about different kinds of music. Um, my favorite quote out of this whole thing is that I, I thought deep thoughts. I sat with that boredom. So, you know, like, okay, I'm in my room and I'm not being productive. And um, I've done my homework and I've done everything else and my friends are all busy. And so I would normally pick up my phone. So they kind of just like flopped on the bed. And I said, what happened? They said, well, you know, I, I lay there for a few minutes and I started to deep think, the, think these deep thoughts. That was really cool. <laughs> do you do this on the bus? You know. Um, but they said all the things that, that should make us happy as adults. Adults. They read a lot more. They baked cookies. Um, they 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 got up and went places. Their relationships with their families changed, and I think this is really interesting. Uh, one of the girls, when we were talking about um, not using earbuds, said, "Well, that's ridiculous. What will I do when I'm sitting in the car with my mother? Because they're being driven everywhere, right?" And by the way, she had a great mother and a good relationship with her mother. Yeah. No, she had great kid, great mother, great relationship. And and you know, I'm I, 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 well, it's why part. So I'm allowed to have an opinion. So I said, well, you could talk to your mother in the car. And she literally said to me, that's ridiculous. That would be unsafe. I would be distracting my mother from driving. And uh, um, do you remember that? I remember 
a number of them talking about. I talked to my parents on the way on the way to Toronto. Or yeah, like, on the way to Toronto. Toronto. Yeah, was... long trip suddenly became really good because my God, I talked to my parents. So once it was, I slept one way and I talked to my dad on the way back. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. And that same girl who thought it was dangerous to distract her mother came back and said, wow, I've had great conversations with my mother because I unplugged. So that, that, that boredom, that space, that spaciousness in their life became filled with things that were really meaningful to them. Um, so our main question then for them was how does network technology affect connections with myself, with other people, and with uh, nature? I'm going to turn it over to Val okay. to walk through some of their major findings. Yeah, and as we're talking, you're reminding me, right after we did this, after the Disconnection Challenge video came out, we had quite a bit of media attention. And oh, yeah. we were trying to get the young people involved as much as possible, but Val and I both did a few interviews on our own. And I was interviewed by some morning radio show from Toronto. Um, it just talk radio you about 7 a.m. and the the interviewer could not get his head around he said the what they they disconnected and one of the things was we disconnected as well because we're part of the group we were co-researchers right so it wasn't the kids do this social experiment and we watch them it was we they designed it but we all did it together and the interviewer could not get his head around we were going to we did this as well and uh, I, I suggested at the end that he would give this a try he said never <laughs> and so here we were on live radio and I was thinking really he could, he could do this he said maybe for five minutes <laughs> and I thought oh that's so lame <laughs> um, but we we were just so fascinated by the stories that we told us and the ways that the things that the young people did and the ways that they navigated the challenge that they had set for themselves so we've got quite a few quotes up now we we wanted the richness of the, the children's words to come across to you so that they could tell this in their own words. So one, one of the people said, I don't think we realize how much we do use technology. It's just part of our routine, so we, we don't realize what we're doing. Then when I wasn't using it for a week, I realized I do use it a lot even though I didn't think I did. That's such a great adolescent quote. Uh, it was interesting. The times that they broke the fast, we really have encouraged them that that is interesting data too, right? This is your rules. You're like, don't feel guilty. Like, let's use that as data. And one of the young people baked cookies, as you said, during the fast. Yeah, and right. the time she broke the fast, she needed to convert something, like tablespoons into cups or something. So she went on, she was just baking cookies and went on her phone to convert and then realize, oh, wait, I'm not supposed to be on my phone, but it was such an, an, a natural part of just what we do, how we bake cookies. And that was a really interesting reflection for her that I thought about the recreational way. I knew I was going to put my Netflix on hold. I knew I was going to um, navigate my Snapchat. <laughs> One of the people let her Snapchat streaks go. Some of them were 300 days old. One person had given a password to a friend to keep her streaks going, so they had different ways of doing this. But they hadn't thought about baking cookies and converting tablespoons to cups. And she realized that she had broken the fast. Just It was such a part of her everydayness that it wasn't until she was actually measuring that she thought, oops. And another young person said, you know, I was checking basketball scores and then I thought, oops. It was just so part of our, just how, how we live. Um, I was more aware of how much I wanted to use it and to talk to my friends and send a bunch of stuff. And so just this idea that it's cool to think about how much we're using our technology to do cool stuff. Sometimes when you um, read the news or look on Facebook, read the headlines, there's some real alarmist ideas about what young people are doing on tech. They're actually doing some really cool things. They told us that one of the things they missed most was sharing jokes. Um, they were talking a lot about memes, and I remember you and I were like, what? <laughs> they were oh, no, teaching I us. I were teaching us. I know memes. <laughs> they were teaching us all these cool things they were doing. Only because I have saying, uh, <laughs> It's not me. 
<laughs> but saying like it's kind of in the moment, like it's actually relationship building to be able to see this funny thing and share it with a bunch of friends. So there was a, a very nuanced story that was emerging. It wasn't we we disconnected and then we had this meaningful time and suddenly I knew my mother in a whole new way. It was like, yeah, I talked to my parents more, but I missed out on some other things. So there was some other good things. So it, it was complex. Um, one of the big things was they really realized just how much they had to use their tech for school and work communications. And again, as Val said, how much we've created a world for them in which they actually are responsible for using tech to keep in touch with us, to do their work, to fulfill their responsibilities. And then I, I we, we often hear, you know, oh, you're online too much. And it's like, you told me I have to be. And so we realized, really, they're navigating a world that we've created. And so to disconnect was actually really tricky for them. And so the fast became this diet because they had to get their work schedules. They, they had to, and they, they were just realizing just how dependent their responsibilities were on their on their tech. Um, doing a homework without being able to check things online was really challenging for them and, and annoying. Though homework was part of the things they, they decided they were allowed to do, they were trying to, one of the people was trying to tone it down and not use it unless she absolutely needed to. And homework became really tricky for her. Um, this idea that on one hand, as, as much as we're really enjoying the time we're spending on tech, it's time consuming, mentally exhausting. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> Just keeping up with all of these streaks, all these things we're doing, all the drama that's going on, it's mentally exhausting. It's a whole new aspect to your life. And so when they stepped back and disconnected, it was a lot of pressure that they didn't have anymore. So there was some kind of relief in this. One of the kids um, said it was easier for me to fall asleep. The day just stretched on. I had so much time to, to do my homework, to, to think the deep thoughts. So the days were stretched out. So it was some really interesting reflections on boredom, the way we live in time, and the way we fill our time. Um, every single kid came back in the end of the reflection saying, it's not as important to me as I thought it was. I thought this was going to be harder. It's not really an important part of my day. It's actually just a, a tool that I use to do the things I need to do a lot of the time, though it does help me. Um, we often think of tech as a, a real distraction. I know when I teach at Queen's and I, I see people on their phones when I'm trying to teach and I think, is it distracting you? But what, what the kids told us is that actually having their, their headphones on while they are doing their schoolwork is really important to keep them focused. And so one kid told us that the way they got around, like they had to find out these workarounds without tech. And so do you remember the story? He said, everybody was talking in my class. I couldn't focus. So I took my desk and I moved it into the corner because I just couldn't focus with everybody else talking and I couldn't have my earbuds in. So that was what he needed to do to be able to actually focus. So instead of distracting him, his tech was helping him focus. Um, my life didn't dramatically change when I stopped. But I wouldn't keep up the fast together. Um, it made me realize it wasn't as important as I thought it was, but I'd still rather have it. My life is better when I've got this. There's things I really enjoy and need from this tech use. So there were a lot of benefits that the young people identified. Um, it's good not to worry about social media. They recognize it impacts how you socialize with people. It's really important to have some unplugged time and go outside. They said you can just um, you, you can just use it to fill in your time, and then you don't feel better after. You've just kind of filled in the time, and then you just kind of feel blah. Whereas on the, after they disconnected, they'd say, you know what? I actually did some things I wouldn't normally have done, and it was great. And I, I was really I want to remember that. Um, it felt more special when I saw my friends in person. Though, 
they did identify it was harder to get together with them because we weren't texting to say, okay, meet me at the park. So unless they arranged it at school, they were sunk. It, I don't know that we have even talked about a landline as part of this. I, I, don't, I was like, that didn't even exist, that option. <laughs> um, but there were benefits. I, this is a direct quote. All of these are. I absolutely don't need this to survive, but I'd still rather have it. It surprised me how much I shared jokes with people and what an, a good part of my life that was. Um, I'd be worried if I didn't have it. This connection between with my mom, with my parents, is, is important. And yeah, she said, my mom needs to contact me. It's not so much I need to contact my mom, it's my mommy might need to contact me. So this importance of this, being able to connect with your parents, was going both ways. Um, tech makes you more open-minded. So it was so interesting because earlier, Val, you said, you know, being off the tech made me more open-minded because I was lying in bed thinking those deep thoughts that come by moving through boredom. But also, being on the tech makes me more open-minded because I can explore the world, I can explore new ideas. And so there were paradoxes going on all over the place. They all came back, as we, we keep talking about this idea, they came back more reflexive in their practice of tech. Um, I'll use it differently now. I check my phone less often. Uh, Snapchat was a really big theme. We have a student who's going to write that up into her master's thesis. Uh, they, one of the people was adamant, I'm going to use Snapchat, but not with people I don't even know. I had streaks for 100 days with people I've never even met. And, and she said, that was kind of a waste of my time. But I still like Snapchat streaks with some people, but I want to make sure I know them. So I'm toning it down. When I'm bored, I have remembered that actually I like to go outside sometimes. I like to bake cookies, and then I'll go outside and have fun. So we're not going to give it up, but we're going to be more intentional users now. One of the interesting things is that we, because of the media launch, um, we'll show you the video in a bit, um, uh, we, we, we talked to the kids, what was it, about five months after, six months after? Was it that long? Three months? Anyway, a long period after, of time. Oh, when we did the launch? Yeah. yeah. No, it was about four months after. Yeah. And so so we, we had an opportunity to say, did it stick? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, did, did it last for a week? And then, boom, you were right back in. And and all of the kids that I talked to said, no, actually, yeah. I, I, I still look at it differently. But what I notice now is when I get caught up in it, I go, I need to go on a diet again. <laughs> and so I pull back. And I, I put it down, and I do something else. So it had given them, um, I, I think the important thing is to Flexivity, a way of, yeah. of of seeing their interaction with the technology, and again that put them in control yeah. of the on technology. their own terms. Yeah, right? they were they were in control. It was uh, I think why it went so well. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, so so when they talked about technology and technological spaces, they really drew out some interesting conclusions. Um, newness means I must get it, but God, it gets boring quickly the first one. You know, it's like a new thing, you've gotten it, but it's, you know, as you use it, it becomes less interesting over time. So, so I, I, I think that's also very, very different discourse than you hear in the press or in policymakers or when you sit down with tech companies about how kids are wired and more wired and more wired. Uh, in actual fact, these tools are a lot of fun when I first get them. And I think that there's a lot embedded in that. If we look at Snapchat, for example, um, um, Snapchat was great because it was more private. It went away. You know, so if I posted something stupid just because I was being silly, I wouldn't be held to account by my teacher, by my principal three weeks later because it would disappear. And yet, as Snapchat caught, tried to capture them as an audience, it changed its platform. So the streak, are you all familiar with streaks? So the, you know, that fire emoji, you know, you've talked to, you've shared a photo with somebody, you know, for 24 hours and you did it again, you get the fire. And the technology tells you, you've got to keep doing that or else you're going to lose your fire. And then every day it goes, one, two, three. So, so some of the kids were talking about, well, you know, one of the reasons I slept better is because my phone didn't ding, you know, at, at, at five minutes before midnight to remind me that the I had to send end. that damn streak. So my streak is going to end. So, so um, I, I think they had a really interesting perspective on the fact that they are very 
intuitively aware of what the technology is asking of them. Not just what the adults are expecting of them when they use it, but the technology is requiring them to perform in certain ways and to do certain things. And disconnecting gave them an opportunity to say, hey, black box, you know, you're a tool, I'm not, kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the, they, they, they also talked about how this ability to to question and understand technology differently um, change their relationship with time, as Val was saying, that they learn to value the time that they weren't connected and also value the time that they were connected. So a number of them said, you know, I used to just, you know, pick up my phone if I was lying in my room and I didn't have anything to do and I'd just start with Instagram and an hour and a half later my brain would be mush and I'd still be doing this. And yet I, I realized that's not an hour and a half I want to invest in Instagram. I get very little out of that. So, so so they were able to resituate themselves in time and space in a different way. And, and again, I think that really reflects Val's slide about agency and the, the rights-based approach, that it reflects that they are choice makers and it positions them as choice makers and people able to make decisions about their own lives. Um, and, and, and their conclusion was that if I'm in charge, I can navigate this, but if I'm not, it's a trap. You know, if you really get into it, it'll suck you in, you won't have time, you won't talk to other people face to face, you won't spend time with your family, you won't go outside, you won't do stuff like that, you won't experience stuff because you're just trapped in this technological space. So, so again, I don't want to leave the space, I don't want to break the technology, I just don't want it driving me, I want to be able to make choices about it. So when we went through, there, there's a number of, of, of really interesting conversations we had. Um, I'm going to throw one in just because I can't resist. So when we're doing the analysis with them, it was a really interesting moment because you can ask things that you don't really ask when you're doing research. Like they talk about this busyness, this imperative to be social. And I, I, I felt really badly for them. And they were complaining because they say, you know, I went to a party during my fast and six of my friends were there and all they did was talk to other people on their phone. And I was completely bored because they were being boring kind of thing. And I said, well, you know, where do you guys talk? Like, like, you know, they're your best friends. Like, when do you, you know, you're 15. When do you stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning and just go, ah, kind of thing? And they, they told us two stories. One was, oh, you know what we did? We went to the dance. There was a school dance. So we told our parents we went to the dance because that meant we were being social and being productive. And so we were allowed to go to the dance, and we snuck out. And Val and I are going, we, they snuck out so they could talk. On the swings. On the swings. <laughs> and Valerie going, like, when I was a kid, when you snuck out of the dance, you weren't talking. Uh, you were doing things your parents would not approve of. And, they, uh, and the same group of kids, and they literally snuck, and they got on the swings, and they're teenagers, and they, they spent an hour and a half just talking. And then they snuck back into the dance. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow. And, and again, good kids, good parents. We've created an environment where the messages to them are that they have to sneak time with their best friends to talk as teenagers. The other one was the sleepover. The sleepover. There were a bunch of kids at a sleepover. It was really boring because everyone was on their phone and taking, you know, like doing the performativity to, I'm on Instagram having a sleepover kind of thing. And then finally people fell asleep. And, as an, and, and then two of them stayed up, two of the best friends stayed up with all the phones gone and everybody gone and they talk for hours and hours whispered to each other kind of across the sleeping bags kind of thing so so I, I it's, it's a fascinating thing and if we put this into privacy and publicity and, and 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 performativity and the pressure on kids to inhabit certain types of reputations in network spaces to satisfy the needs of the platforms I think gives us a much broader understanding of the kinds of problems we have when it comes to privacy regulation uh, particularly with this age group. The, the other thing that was really fascinating that came out of this was they were so excited. They said, other people should do this. Yeah. And, and we said, well, that's a cool idea. What do you want to do about that? And they said, we want to create a YouTube video, which again is using the technology for their own purposes. So we're disconnecting, but we want to make a video about disconnecting so we can put it on the internet so we can get other people to disconnect. <laughs> uh, but it was really, really important to them that they took this opportunity to share what they had learned with other kids. So, so we they, they did do a, they we created a video which was a, a great deal of fun. Um, it's 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 kind of like the uh, it's like a documentary video in the sense that they use the words that came out of the research itself. Um, but this is um, this is their message to uh, to their peers. Box, if you click on that. 
Have you ever wondered how connected you are? For two weeks, we kept track of our media use. What we were doing and why. Keeping Snapchat streaks. <laughs> Looking for memes. Listening to music. Doing homework. Organizing our lives. Watching Netflix. Then we took a media fast for seven full days and kept track again. We let ourselves do some things. Like texting our parents to pick us up. Watch movies with our families. <laughs> Listening to music as long as you didn't have headphones on. And doing our homework. But other than that, we stopped everything. Before the fast, I thought it was going to be a disaster. Super boring. <laughs> Annoying, and it was, but I got used to it, eventually. I didn't find it as hard as I thought it would be. I found it was more open-minded. The first day, I was wondering about my shows, but then I sort of forgot, and it was okay. I actually didn't really miss it much. Once you try, it's not actually that bad. During the fast, I found the day just really stretched out, and I did more stuff. I hung out with friends in person. Did homework well before deadlines. Listened to music with friends and family. I thought deep thoughts. I ended my staff track streaks, and some of them were with people I didn't even know. I read a lot. Ate cookies and went downtown. I talked to my mom more during car rides. I was surprised by how much thinking I did. I lost a lot of my Snapchat streaks. I always thought I'd feel sorry, like I had some connection to them or something. But a lot of the people I didn't even know in person, and I Snapchatted them for over a hundred days. Like, no offense, that was kind of a waste of my time. I don't think we realize how much we do use technology. We just think that it's it's part of our routine, so we don't think about what we're doing. And then when we weren't using technology for a week, I realized how much I did use technology, even though I didn't think I did. I realized like how much time I actually had left when I didn't use social media. During the fast, it was easier for me to fall asleep because there was no distractions. I think technology does affect how you think and how you socialize with people. If you use technology way too much, you'll have no social skills. I absolutely don't need this to survive, but I would still rather have it. But since the fast, I've been using technology differently. I don't even spend as much time on Snapchat anymore. I'm toning it down a bit, and I haven't been caring about it as much. So when I'm bored, I'm like, okay, I should go outside. And then I go outside, and I actually have fun. Social media can suck you in. Some people won't talk to each other face to face. They won't spend time with the family. They won't go outside. They won't do stuff or experience stuff. This experiment helped me to see that I don't actually use much social media. You can live without it, and there's nothing stopping you from doing that except for you. There are lots of challenges on social media, yeah. so we challenge you to stop altogether for just seven days. Just connect and see what happens. Can you do it? So from a, from a research dissemination point of view, these kids were incredibly successful. This got picked up by CBC TV, CBC Radio, um, all kinds CTV, of newspapers. newspapers, yeah, yeah, like all across Ontario. Some of it went national. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, so they were really proud of themselves. So thank you for your attention and we'd, we'd love to uh, talk about it with you. Yeah. Oh, it's related questions of <clears throat> the whole sense of overprotection. Yeah. I found really fascinating. Yeah. Um, have you been had the opportunity to do this kind of work with much less privileged children, uh, uh, you know, very poor, uh, segregated? At this sort of sense of technically surveilled overprotection by their parents, and also a related question from the perspective of parenting. Um, the This notion of responsible parenting as being technically uh, uh, skilled in surveilling, I guess, um, uh, how, how does that fit in in terms of like have you thought about that? You know, this notion of how responsible parenting has changed and how that impacts parents who don't have all these technical capabilities. Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, maybe I'll take the first one and, and leave you to talk about the, the tech one. Sure. In terms of the, the overprotection project, um, with a lot of the same kids, and they were actually a, an unusual group of kids. Several of them had parents who were professors at, at Queen's. They, they had had quite a bit of 
privilege and opportunity in their lives and, and they recognize that. So your point is well taken that you're going to get different perspectives from different groups. But we, um, with that project as well, we had the opportunity to do, to do all kinds of spin-off things including um, at that time that we were doing it there was a creation of something called the National Position Statement on Outdoor Play and so that was nationally across Canada and we were able to link into that work which was more representative of kids across Canada and we've also had a very very fruitful um, research relationship with the Boys and Girls Club and that uh, is a group of equally insightful kids with very uh, different kinds of experiences, different kinds of opportunities and different kinds of barriers because every kid has unique experiences and we, we definitely heard very similar themes from those different groups that we were working with. We've, we've been doing qualitative work across Canada on a number of projects and been able to talk to you young people who are new immigrants, young people who um, have um, any any number of kinds of experiences, including in northern Canada. And I think what, what's really struck me by listening to children is how similar their experiences are and how unique and distinct at the same time, uh, which is one of the wonderful things about doing qualitative work with kids. So certainly I, I think there's a general sense that kids recognize that they want to be kept safe and yet they don't want to be kept too safe. They recognize that adults want to keep them safe, but they, they, we heard over and over again, we're caught that when we don't get to do things, we don't get to grow strong. Um, if you're interested in this video um, that the kids made about this, it's on the www childhealth2 um, website, childhealth2.com, I think it might be CA. It's a little shout out to that project. One of the things that we've been talking to a very diverse group of um, 100 kids across Canada about is nature. And it's been really striking how um, a lot of people have experienced nature as very empowering and challenging, whereas other kids were hearing, no, I don't go outside, it's not safe. Um, there might be sharks, and that's actually very true in some parts of the world, but probably not in Ontario. But th that, that kind of thing is like a very legitimate, like a, a fear that is very valid in that child's life. I'm afraid of this. Um, I was interviewing, so I interviewed all across Canada about um, different connections, and in the far north, um, in a, an Inuit community, heard that going out on the land is this incredibly empowering experience. Whereas I heard from, and this is Nuna, but I heard from kids in Toronto, no, it's too cold. <laughs> or or you, it, outdoors is where you go to get eaten, right? And I'm thinking, wow, I would actually understand that in some places in, in remote Nunavut, but not in Toronto. It's probably not, like a, even being eaten by a bear is probably not your biggest fear. And yet we've created a culture of fear I think around our young people that they're trying really hard to navigate and yet we feed that with uh, the ways that we try to protect them. I think you're not always in keeping with what their experiences actually are. It links back to, oh, in a way, what you were talking about, pornography, mm -hmm. it, which may be a very valid concern in some context, but in general that's actually not the biggest thing we, we should be worried about, and maybe we're misplacing some of our adult fears and fueling um, problems or concerns that kids don't really have and, and not noticing things that they actually really could use our help with. We're also not taking responsibility for what we're actually in control yeah. of. So we're in control of the online environment, we're in control of online pornography. We don't fix it, we fix the kids. And the kids actually aren't broken. They, yeah. you know, um, Just, just to, to build on what you were saying, um, in 2011 as part of the Young Canadians in the Wired World project, um, we, we uh, recruited from different sources. So we recruited kids from high socioeconomic status through libraries and low socioeconomic status um, through um, boys and girls clubs, both in, mainly in Toronto and in um, um, Calgary. And, and what was really fascinating was that we heard the same things from kids all across the board. You know, this is how the technology is affecting me. These are the things that bug me. I don't want to be spied on. Um, and, and as well, we heard, you know, we understand where our parents are coming from. They love us. They're just trying to protect us, but they don't understand the environment we're in. 
So, so we found that interesting. We'll be following up with that with the quality, um, qualitative work that we're going to be doing in the next few months because we're looking at it intersectionally. And one of the things that we're looking at is the intersections with socioeconomic status. Um, but the parents had very different relationships. Um, I would say that the, the parents with higher socioeconomic status felt much more in control and that they were able to use these tools and provide these tools to help their children succeed in life. Whereas the parents from lower socioeconomic status just felt pressure. Like it was an absolute insane amount of pressure. You know, like the computer's about to go, I gotta buy a new one, I gotta get my kid a phone. Um, and and I, I, I am absolutely sure I'm setting my kid up for some kind of danger. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm so so I spy on them, and I feel guilty about it. So so I, I think that the it's surprising because I would have expected to see different access even, you know. Whereas when we have done access, it's it's kind of like if you look at it globally, people will use different tools. So if you're in lower socioeconomic status, you might rely on a phone rather than a laptop or an iPad. But access is 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 pretty well universal. Um, but the the it, it puts an awful lot of pressure on the family. So it's, and like I said, we hope to explore that in more detail in the next little while. Um, what comes to parenting? Um, I, there are a number of things going on. So we did do, we, we interviewed the parents in 2011 as well, and I know it's old data. Um, we've worked with parents, I often work with parent-teacher groups, that type of thing. And, and I would say that one of the things that's really interesting from the parents' point of view is that they're being told to do certain things. Yeah. And when they don't comply, they get yelled at too. So um, as a parent, I'll speak for myself, I was told my kids had to get a Google account because they were in high school. And I told my husband to take a flying hike. And I was considered a bad parent. Um, and my kids were forced to get these accounts, even though my kids didn't want them either, kind of thing. So, so a lot of what, it, I, I, I think now parenting, when we, when we do the research with parenting, it's become really complicated because you, you don't have a village but you've got a bunch of people trying to invade it. So you don't have anybody to fight with you on man the barricades, but you've got all of this media trying to grab your kid's attention. And, and it's exhausting to push back against it. Um, and it's particularly exhausting if you don't have a lot of resources kind of thing. So um, um, I, I think the easy fix has been filled by the corporate model that drives a lot of online sites, particularly around kids. So over the years, starting in 1997, when we talked about online privacy for children, we were talking about privacy from corporations because they were spying on them and using their data in all sorts of weird ways that we thought were bad ideas. Now if you go on those very same sites, privacy is all about safety. And the corporation is now positioned as the person who places your child under surveillance to protect them from strangers. So there's been a co-opting of the parent role saying, you know, be my partner, put your child in this safe space, and you won't have to worry about it. And then there's, uh, Gary Markson and I, and I did a, a really fun um, project where we looked at all the technologies that are being um, uh, sold to parents and how they're advertised to parents and what you're told. And the thing that always strikes me about that particular piece of research is that you've got a bunch of people who love their kids, who want to do what's right for them, and they're being told, just buy this baby monitor. <clears throat> but at the same time, if you look at the advertising of the baby monitor, it means you can have a glass of wine and eat dinner downstairs and you won't have to be with your kid. It, it's, which changes the relationship between the child and the parent significantly. Um, we saw this years ago with um, Kotex. Kotex open, uh, created a whole education site for kids, girls, um, all about menstruation, everything you need to know about menstruation. Come here, Kotex will tell you. And it started by saying, we get it. You can't talk to your mother about these things. It's just too embarrassing. Yeah. But we're here for you. So, so it's, 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 it, it's, it's a very comp it's a complex question because parenting is being mined in different ways for commercial purposes that interfere with the relationships that are at the heart of nurturing a child. Um, and parents feel that pressure as well. So in one sense, you're given this easy out, which you feel really guilty about spying. You're told to do these things by the school will send home stuff and say, if your child's on social media, <laughs> grab their passwords. You know, and, and then as a researcher, you're going and go, not a good idea. Let me tell you about the outcomes when that happens. Um, so, so I think parents are really between a rock and a hard place, but it's a very confusing set of pressures. Yeah. 
Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Both of you at once. <laughs> no. In stereo. <laughs> sorry. Um, sure. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you were mentioning about how some kids or lots of children feel that technology is sort of being forced upon them where the common narrative is like they take to it so naturally. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of articles recently about like increases in anxiety amongst kids from using um, <coughs> social media. And it was, so I was wondering, did any of that come out from having um, a cleanse? And then it, I, it also made me think from what you were mentioning that the parents' anxiety comes from them not being connected and the kids' anxiety is rooted in over-connection perhaps. So I guess, did you hear anything about that either from the kids or the parents? Such, such a good question. In fact, we spent half of yesterday talking about that. We're writing a, a new um, project grant with the uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research to address exactly that. And our hypothesis is that there's actually a strong relationship. But what, I, I think it's more complex than smartphones are making kids anxious. But, but I think that there's a piece of it. And there's some relationship between this alarming anxiety that we're seeing as a public health researcher. We look at the mental health and particularly anxiety of in particular adolescent girls as one of the most acute public health problems that is non-communicable. And yet it is communicable and I think by, in the way by the ecologies we create around our children and, and force them to live in. So we have some responsibility there. So I, th I think there's a relationship. We did not hear that in this study. And I, I think that's for a couple of reasons. One, the young people designed the study, and I don't know, did you hear it? Like, the, the, they the, talked about worry. It was nice worry. It was nice not to worry about social media. Not to worry about it. It was nice it. not to have the pressure of it. It was nice to, like that. We and the that. Uh, one place it came up in, I want to make sure I can get hold of my mom, or that my mom can get hold of me. Except for one of the guys um, actually is a professional video game player, and he was anxious about being disconnected for so long because of... It's his profession. Yes. It's his profession. But not in the way that, is, and so I think that represents an anomaly in the sample that we had. Um, partly um, by like sampling bias, by they participated because they wanted to do this project. They weren't, they were un unusual kids in that they, I don't, I, w I would guess none of them were prone to anxiety, but I think if we did uh, this study in a different, with a different group of young people that might come up more, or with a different group of parents, that would be my guess. That's, but they didn't design the study. To, and you know, the questions you ask um, influence the answers that you get, which is why it's so important to have the, the kids involved in determining what questions actually need to be asked now. But I, I think that's a really, really important question, and we'll be back in three years to, to tell you what we've learned. So I think that that is one, the relationship between mental health and girls in particular and new media is, is essential that we address it from a multidisciplinary, intersectional, um, population-based approach. So that's and, what we're doing next. And even, <laughs> yeah, and even with this population, they slept better. They slept better. They, you know, they had less worries. So, so there are definitely markers there that are worth exploring. Um, so, one of our equality partners, the Alberta Teachers Association and Phil McRae, has just started a, um, a longitudinal um, research project um, looking at the neurological impacts of um, technology on kids' cognition and uh, health in general. And uh, he's doing that with Di uh, Dr. Michael Rich, who's at Harvard. And that's also a really interesting piece because um, a number of researchers are beginning to measure the physiological um, markers of stress and anxiety and, yeah. and, and neurological change. So that'll be interesting to see play out as yeah. well. And even that kind of um, implicit um, message that I have to be able to get hold of you at all times. Well, what does that, what, what does a kid pick up? Like, why? What's going to happen to me if you can't? And I think we implicitly send these, but this is not written in the Actually, data, so I don't want to follow this too Do you know, too it's far. funny, because there's a study that came out of, it was either Denmark or um, Sweden. I think it's Danish. And it was on um, parents' use of video cameras um, at um, daycare. 
and and so um, um, they had webcams. So there were cam cameras where you could watch your child on the screen when you were at work. Yeah. And their conclusion was it had nothing to do with the safety of the child. It was relieving the parents' anxiety because they were separated from their child. Yeah. And they did not want to be, and they felt badly about it, and it created anxiety. So parent tell guilt and anxiety thing is driving a lot of this. Yeah. Uh, here. Um, it's funny that you say that my friend has a dog and she puts it in doggy daycare and she watches the webcam of the daycare all day. Well, um, but that wasn't my question. <laughs> <laughs> How much is doggy daycare? <laughs> wow. Um, I was wondering if any of the students kind of commented on the way that their use of technology, I know it's a, kind of the network technology with themselves, others, and nature, but about in the kind of immediate physical space because I notice a lot of people, and it's something that I wouldn't consider socially acceptable, and I don't think my parents would or my friends, where you're on your device and you're in a public space or in a car with friends and you play a video out loud. Um, and when I've said that to my younger cousins, they say, yeah, you're just being uptight. But for me, it would be really rude if I ever did that in a car with friends or in a public space without headphones on. And I was just wondering if there was anything about that, the way that that technology changes in the immediate space. Well, it's funny you say that because yesterday we were working on this data and we decided we want to write a paper on space and time um, because it, it's actually quite rich and there are a number of, uh, like the, the one that comes to mind is the bus. You know that I'm on, and even in, I'm in the and class, class I'm and the I class, have to go put yeah. my desk over here to get me new people to leave me alone, kind of thing. Um, so there, there certainly was a lot of discussion that implicated time and space, and we haven't really gone through that analysis, but I think it will be interesting. Um, the, it's consistent with research we've done for years, where um, um, earbuds and noise are a way of, like you said, concentrating, making the the other people in the classroom go away, so I can concentrate on my schoolwork, that type of thing. Um, but it's it's. I, I think they had, even if you think about their, I go outside, I don't go outside, the, the change in my bedroom when my phone isn't in my bedroom, a lot of it was embodied, actually. I'm, I'm drawing on conversations I've been having with Michael Vaughn. Um, we're looking at performativity uh, uh, and embodiment. So, so Michael Vaughn is the, um, uh, an absolutely brilliant privacy advocate for the BC Civil Liberties Association. Uh, and, but Michael has a previous, many previous lives, one of which, I know outing her, is um, as a, a, in theatre. So she comes from theatre. And we were talking about kids' experiences in, socio in these socio-technical spaces and how there's just, they float in these performances that are disconnected from whom they, who they are. So Jane and I have been looking at data we collected with photos that I don't put up me on Instagram because I'm random and plus I want privacy, but I do put up pictures of horses because that makes a good Instagram theme and I get likes, right? And, and Michael said that if you think about theater, when you, when you block a play, you've got, everybody's got their, their, their script, everybody's on the stage and you walk around and you say the lines yeah. and you stand where you're going to stand. And then you go over here and you do that, and that's blocking. And then when you perform the play, um, um, the actor's expression is you give it weight. And suddenly it becomes this incredible story that draws in an audience. And so I, I think that, that, that the, the time and space aspect is really important because it, it talks to the nature of embodiment. And, and my instinct is that even when kids are using technology, they're still embodied. And, and yet we, we, we often talk about distanciation and time and space, and, and yet we're human. So one of the reasons why we've been increasingly orienting our, our, our work through the, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child is because human rights is that, that, that counterweight to it that says, no, the human matters. And we have to focus on the human, and I think that's why the rights-based approach yeah. is so important. So again, I'll let yeah, you know because that, yeah. we're going to be doing that analysis. <laughs> You're encouraging us to keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, but good instincts because it's yeah. really interesting. Good question. Um, I had a question about like almost the opposite because I find that a lot of like family friends they're really bothered about their children using phones and iPads, but then they come home and they're on their phones and iPads, and mm -hmm. I wonder how much of it is like kind of you know what you see, what you do kind of <laughs> where. That's what their parents do in their free time. So why wouldn't I do it if I have this available? Like, did you find that there? 
Um, we didn't address that with this group, but in every other study yeah. I've done, it always comes up. I hate when my mother uses her phone. Yeah, um, and we it, did that in our health study as well. Yeah, it, just, it really came as we up. studied, and it comes out so often when we're asking just about basically about health. Uh, I remember a, a child in Northern Ontario said to me, "Oh." My mom comes home from work and she just goes and plays video games for an hour. <laughs> and, and the child was so frustrated with the parents' technology use, and we heard that over and over again. So I think exactly as monkey see, monkey do. This is what we teach them and model and criticize for, right? And so we need to think about our own role in this. Many years ago, my oldest was two, and I had a deadline, and I was working at a computer, um, and it was a deadline. I had a lot to do, and, and she kept trying to get my attention, and I kept going, mommy's working, mommy's working, and I go to the bathroom, and I come back, and she's taken talcum powder, baby powder, and put it all over the keyboard, <laughs> because she'd had enough of that computer, yeah. um, and, and no, I, I think it's true. It, it, it's, that's a consistent thing we hear across the country and from all kids. It's one thing when I'm using it, but as soon as my parents pick it up, I hate it. And we know this uh, from public health research, yeah. right? and all kinds of educational research, that children learn not from what we tell them to do, not from what we teach them, but by what we show them. I mean, over and over. There's so much data on that. If you want a child to learn something, do it. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they learn things that we wish they hadn't learned, right? By our reactions. They learn fear from our fears. They learn uh, how we be, are in the world, how, how we want people to hope that they will be in the world from our own interactions and behaviors and modeling. And that's the single most important thing that may be our piece in this. is not to tell them, oh, do this, do this, but to show them this is how to live as a healthy human being, which we, I don't think we do a good job. We could certainly do better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your time. It was a real pleasure. And uh, watch this space. We'll be back. <laughs> thank you so much.